Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 2022 International Open Seminar on Semiotics, a tribute to John Dilley on the 50th anniversary of his passing. Whether you are watching us live now or watching the recording on YouTube, I would like to welcome you. This collaborative international open scientific initiative and celebration connects a network of dozens of personalities and organizations coming from various environments and with different profiles, all working in unison towards the advancements and propagation of semiotic studies. So today's presentation is entitled Time and the Sensible and will be given by Professor Dr. Julio Pinto. So I would like to, to thank you, Professor Julio Pinto, for being here, for accepting the, our invitation. And also, I would like to, well, to thank you and welcome, of course, Professor Mario Santiago de Carvalho. He will be the commentator of today's presentation. So I will start by introducing Professor uh, Julio Pinto, and then uh, we will start uh, his uh, talk. So Dr. Julio Pinto has a PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he served as teaching assistant of Portuguese and visiting lecturer at the Department of Romance Languages. He did postdoctoral work at the Catholic University of Portugal. He acted as chair of the doctoral program in comparative literature at the Federal University of Minas Gerais, chair of the graduate program in communication at the same university, and later as chair of the graduate program in communication at the Pontifical Catholic University of Minas Gerais in Brazil. He was president of COMPOS, which is the Brazilian Association of Graduate Programs in Communication from 2011 to 2013, and was previously its vice president. He authored many books, the first of which was The Reading of Time, and also he wrote book chapters and articles published in Brazilian and foreign journals. And in his curriculum, the most current terms related to his scientific and cultural activities are semiotics, language, communication, philosophy of a language, theory of the image, cine cinema and television, uh, art, electronic media, and intersemiotic translation. He is currently a member of Kairos, an international organization of university presidents and notable scholars dedicated to the enhancement of higher education and research. Thank you so much for being here with us, and you can start your presentation. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, very nice introduction. Uh, I hope you can all hear me well. Uh, uh, greetings, and uh, I thank the University of Coimbra for so kindly uh, having invited me to participate in this one seminar uh, as a homage to uh, my friend uh, John Dealey, uh, with whom uh, I had, you know, uh, many, many interesting conversations about our common subject, semiotic, semiotic theory mostly. Well, and also greetings to all of you who are getting ready to suffer for about one hour. I cannot promise that the ordeal will be mild and light because ordeals are supposed to be neither mild nor light. But I swear I'll do my best to make it at least bearable. I chose to talk about my latest research project, uh, uh, the matter of time in relation to the sensible in the specific realm of the digital world, even though I suspect, given my own empirical observations, that these remarks could very well be extended to daily living, especially when we are exposed to communication media in general, that is television, radio, and even printed newspapers and magazines. To do so, I intend to discuss to start by discussing uh, the sensible in a kind of uh, bird's eye view, 
to lay out the foundation for the reasoning that I'll, that I'll try to develop here. And the second half, as it were, will be a discussion of time as we experience it. And maybe the kinds of cognitive changes, or at least strategies, that this experience might entail. Uh, naturally, in discussing the sensible, I will have to walk on a path that most of you will feel has been trodden ad nauseum. But please bear with me because I promised a challenge and not an answer because the answers are boring. The notions of sense and perception go hand in hand as most definitions of one will mention the other. And our own sensorial experience will include the experience of perception or maybe the perception of experience. Let us address the notion of perception such as I, I will be using it in this conversation with y'all. And here I, uh, I ask leave to lapse into this American Southernism as I live in North Carolina and uh, I feel that I should pay my respects to the people who receive me so well here. Anyways, let us plunge into this. Notable Chilean biologists, Maturana and Varela, possibly following earlier hints from Jakob van Uxkud, very well known to a lot of you, suggest that living has to do with computing information from the environment. To live is to compute, they say. Living organisms, regardless of their complexity, have a way of finding out what is out there that may serve or not their interests, thus preparing them for further action. Thus, bats, as you know, will deal with distances differently from eagles or snakes. The latter use their tongues as sensors, whereas bats depend on such on sound, that is, to figure out distances. And eagles are, of course, famous for their very powerful eyesight. And canines have potent senses of smell and hearing. We humans depend largely on vision, even though we are unable to see anything that falls outside of the realm between red and violet, and infrared and ultraviolet must be instrumentalized to become available to us. Our sense of smell is negligible as compared to that of dogs, but on the other hand, the grip and power of our thumbs has enabled us to use things other than our bodies to enhance our ability to deal with the world without. But of course, uh, Crows are known to do exactly the same thing with their beaks, not to mention the apes. And this is, of course, uh, all common knowledge. Nevertheless, there are a few subtleties that are worth talking about. First of all, perceiving is not merely feeling that something that comes from outside and hits us. This has to do with an old maxim, agere secundum esse, roughly acting or action according to being. And Maturana will say this, live beings are structurally determined dynamic systems and everything that happens in them is determined by their structure all the time. And this means that the environment cannot specify what occurs in a living system. And it can only trigger in its structure changes that are determined, structurally determined. Constitutionally, therefore, a living system always operates in structural congruence with the environment. And it exists as such only insofar as the structural congruence is preserved. And to give examples, and I have given this example so often that I, I almost memorized it, a frog does not have in its vision and nervous apparatus any register for motionlessness. This means that it's not equipped to see anything that stands still. The insect 
that will be its food will only perceived only be perceived when it moves. In other words, the mere existence of the insect does not guarantee nourishment for the frog. That is, the motionless object or insect is the latent data, only latent data, because it lies outside of the animal's structurality. I made up this word. It is outside of that which froggily, that's another word that I made up, made up would be its language, because language is a much wider concept than a verbal construct. In our terms, the motionless insect is not assigned to the frog. The real information, the object of that sign, and the interpretant that comes out of that sign, that which lies within its language, is the movement of the insect. That is, when it is seen, interpreted as food, and eaten by the animal. And what's to see? To see is to perceive some visual datum and to process it into information. To see is to partake in a process of communication. This is a, an interesting statement uh, for us to think about. That is, the action of picking out some data and it, interpreting it, making it relevant to that organism so that the information is placed in what may be dubbed the space of interaction of the organism with its Lebensfeld. Nietzsche uh, speaks of this in a much more poetic but no less truthful way. Uh, he says, there is no form in nature because there is no in and no out. Every art is born in the mirror of the eye. Well, this is, uh, so far, uh, something that I'm building in order for us to come to a, a first preliminary conclusion. We're starting to glimpse the idea that data without communication is the same as the motionless insect for the frog. It's nothing. So we might draw this partial conclusion from the remarks above. To communicate is to interpret data and derive information. Therefore, for one thing, to live is to communicate. At the foundation of communication is perception, the unique way, the unique way in which organisms interact with their environment according to their own way of being. And once again, the ancients were right. Agedit secundum esse. Furthermore, and of course we can always complicate things, to perceive is active, not passive. The point is driven home by a philosopher from Berkeley, California, like those of Madurana. No, it says, perception is not something that happens to us or in us. It is something we do. Think of a blind person tap tapping his or her way around a cluttered space, perceiving that space by touch, not all at once, but through time by skillful probing and movement. The world makes itself available to the perceiver through physical movement and interaction. So perception experience acquires content thanks to our possession of bodily skills. And what we perceive is determined by what we do or what we know how to do. He argues, moreover, no way argues, moreover, that there is some kind of representation. And this is pretty important to us. A content or a structure that follows or perhaps presides over the sensorial experience. It may very well be that we see what's already stored in our memory, so much so that before Darwin, having proposed his theory, had been widely accepted, albeit in constantly revised and reviewed fashion. People were blind to those weird bones they may have found on their farmland and construed as strangely shaped rock formations. After all, animals of such a natural shape did not just walk the earth, 
and those rocks did not look like the bones of any animal they were familiar with. Those rocks became fossils only after the knowledge of evolution was established, or at least widespread. Considerations around this idea that language, or at least the logos in the platonic tradition plays, even if the extent of such a role cannot be determined in any precise manner, there seems to be little doubt that what we know interacts with what we perceive. The very basic tenets of neuroscience confirm that we animals see that which is already part of our memory. The signals that make up a sight are compared to similar ones already in the brain. And then we see, be, is it, be it as it may, we must change course here to take a look at the relationship of all this with language. And of course, and I apologize for that, we shall begin with Plato. In his discussion of uh, to pragma auto, the thing itself, Plato lays out the foundation of a discussion that will much later on find echoes in Kant, Hegel, Husserl, Heidegger. About this thing, there is no writing in mind, nor can there be one. It is not, in fact, in any way sayable, as in other disciplines, not the matter. But after a long time around the thing itself, and he says that in Greek, perito pragma auto, and after much experience, suddenly, like the light coming from the spark, it is born in the soul and feeds itself. This, of course, this is, of course, part of Plato's theory of ideas, and it has to do with the distinction made much later between things and objects. Namely, that things are existence that do not depend on our knowing about them, and objects are knowns that do not necessarily have to exist. Naturally, things that we know are objects, like chairs, automobiles, books, food, the people around us. They are things in so far as they exist, and they are objects as well, in so far as we know, as we know them. However, there are objects that we know about and manipulate that do not classify as things, myths. In Brazil, there is a myth that does not classify as a thing, sorry for the political uh, aside, money, superheroes, cryptocurrencies. We might even dwell upon etymologies to apprehend this, but I'm not going to dwell much on etymologies. I was going to talk about uh, the Proto-Indo-European root of exist and uh, be in Portuguese, a star, in Spanish, also a star, French, être, originally estre, and so on and so forth. But that means to be out there. Now, a thing, therefore, is something out there. While an object is something that is thrown at me, object, uh, thrown towards, it comes my way, an object. So an object is therefore something that I get to know about a thing or somebody else's object. Because, for example, the knowledge of a unicorn is something that is passed on through generations and people know about it, even though such an animal, to our knowledge, does not exist. It is not to pragma auto. Objects are therefore within the realm of language, that is, that which makes us know. Consequently, existence are part of language only insofar as they're known. I must stress at this point that I owe much of this discussion to my friend, John Dee, with whom I had many lengthy conversations about this topic. It seems obvious by now that the unsayability of things has to do with the fact that the wholeness of the thing is not knowable. The objective part of them is describable and sayable, but of course, the pragma auto continues to be unfathomable. In other words, language is a fragile and defective entity, but that's all that we have. Plato puts it this way. The knowledge of the thing itself is lightened up by rubbing together names, logoi, visions, and sensations, and testing them. 
This sounds like verse, doesn't it? Well, he goes on to say that the thing itself has in language its proper place, even if language is certainly not entirely adequate to it on account of its frailty. One might conclude that the pragma auto is only possible and in and because of language, even though it transcends language. In our terms, things are only possible as objects. This is the reason why Aristotle states in his metaphysics that Plato's theory of ideas had been born out of a surge in language. Skepsis and tois logois. At this point, I might throw in a hint about what is to come. The absolute present is unsayable. In the anima, famous Aristotle's uh, famous famous uh, book by Aristotle on the soul, he describes the five senses, dwelling much on vision, and proposes that in perception a sense organ takes the form of a sense object without the matter. The statement has for years been the subject of debate among scholars, Aristotelian scholars. In general, the debate can be subsumed into two models. There is either a literal or a phenomenal interpretation of the sentence. The literal interpretation presupposes that the sense perception actualizes the potential present in the organ by means of a physiological change. For example, the eye turns red when in the presence of a red object. There's, I apologize uh, here for oversimplifying it, simplifying it, but it's just to give an idea of the gist of the controversy. The phenomenal interpretation of perception sees it not as a physiological alteration at all. It, the organ does not literally become or take on the form of the sense objects. That is, the eye does not turn red. The eye, therefore, does not undergo any physiological change. It is affected phenomenally insofar as the sense object appears through them when the perceiver is present. It's only fitting, therefore, that I should follow and adopt the phenomenal view as it underlies the previous argument that perception picks up the thing in itself to make it into an object without the matter. Without the matter part is what makes it possible to think of an object. That is, that which is known but does not have the materiality of things. Well, again, I tell you, that's kind of a foreshadowing. This is a literary technique. The importance of this preliminary discussion will be made apparent momentarily. We should take up Plato again. He suggested that perception and understanding involve rubbing together logoi, vision, sensations. This is certainly what underlies a proposition made many centuries later by a guy called Charles Sanders Peirce to the effect that there are three categories of experience. Everyone is familiar with firstness, secondness, and thirdness. And we're all aware that Peirce places sensation of feeling in a category of firstness. He states in, in the collected papers of first volume, uh, paragraph 129, that by a feeling, I mean an instance of that kind of consciousness which involves no analysis, no comparison, or any process whatsoever, nor consists in whole or in part of any act by which one stretch of consciousness is distinguished from another, which has its own positive quality, which consists in nothing else and which is of itself all that it is, however it may have been brought about, so that if this feeling is present during a lapse of time, it is wholly and equally present at every moment of that time. To reduce this description to a simple definition, I will say that a feeling by feeling, I mean an instance of that sort of element of consciousness, which is all that it is positively in itself, regardless of anything else. Two things need to be underscored here. First, the presentness of sensation. And second, its uniqueness. Elsewhere, in, an, in the Collected Papers, Volume 2, Paragraph 85, Peirce writes a little more explicitly about originality, and he associates it with presentness, that which is felt but not known or thought about. It is as though we were talking about pure pathos, or 
thoughts. So again, I quote the verse. Let us now consider what would appear as being in the present instance, instant, were it utterly cut off from past and future. We can only guess, for nothing is more occult than the absolute present. There plainly could be no action, and to talk of binarity would be to utter words without meaning. There might be a sort of consciousness, a feeling, with no self, and this feeling might have been its tone. The world would be reduced to a quality of an analyzed feeling. I cannot call it unity, for even unity presupposes plurality. I may call its form firstness, orius, or originality. It would be something which is what it is without reference to anything within it or without it, regardless of all force or all reason. Of course, we know that there is no such thing as pure firstness as regards our own perception of things. A little before this remarks in the previous paragraph, 84, first says that experience as is an essay in preterito, a being in the past. And the past is defined by him as a fait accompli. He then plunges into brute force and binarity, which is actually the object that we experience, the experience that we know. For no other reason, and that's an interesting fact, the Aymaras, it's an ethnic uh, indigenous group in South America, they speak of the past, and when they speak of the, the past, they point their fingers forward as if to indicate that that is what they can see. And the future is referred to them as something behind them, something not seen. Just the opposite of our Western thought. As linear time is present, precedes past, which and future is something that lies ahead of us. The future is referred to by them to by them as something behind them, something not seen. So it's clear by now that reality is a second. And it's now clear that reality is always past vis-a-vis our experience of it. So in a nutshell, the present is a first, the past is a second. The present is felt, but not known. The past was felt and it is known. So there is a difference between experience and living a phenomenon. Living a phenomenon is to be inserted into it or to insert it into ourselves or both at the present moment so that it becomes what Peirce would call a pre-sentiment, something that occupies our conscience without our analyzing it. It's like what happens to us when we listen to some kind of music that is particularly important to us. The music sort of occupies all of our awareness. The experience of a phenomenon is something that we have been acquainted with, something that might even help us understand our living other phenomena later on. Experience is therefore a past which helps us with future phenomena, or to put it differently, once again, the past is the observable, the present is the sensible. The past is observable. The present is the sensible. Let us keep this in mind for a while. In his approach to the automation of image perception by digital technologies, French thinker Paul Virigo touches on the issue of temporality in terms of the image's mental persistence, insofar as such persistence is not merely retinal but it also hinges on the memory of ocular perceptions, as there is no fixed image from the perspective of the physiology of sight, eye motility and eye mobility. There is no guarantee of temporal univocality because seeing is traveling. It is a perceptive activity. Remember Noe when he says that perception is action, seeing is traveling. It is a perceptive activity that began in the past in order to shed light on the present to focus on the object of immediate perception. His argument is that this cognitive 
emphatic object that captures our eyes is no longer what he calls a potent image. He's talking about images. One of anaphoric function, but a cliche that seeks through the gaze of the one who sees it to gain depth and fill itself with some sort of vicarious meaning. In other words, such a, such a potency, that is the ability to make a reference and to be interpretable, is emptied and its perception becomes purely present even though it's possible to assimilate. It's the seduction of its imagetic cliche to a prospection that is a cataphoric projection into the future. Now, revisiting the potent image, though, we must remember that the reference it makes to its object gives us the illusion of the re-manifestation of the object, or in Persian terms, its recognition in thirdness of the visual object. Such a, percept a perceptive uh, recognition never fulfills the logical re or requirement of complete description, but it's enough for analogic identification by ourselves. The analog would therefore be the re-identification of an object distorted by the very process of perception. But at any rate, it depends on the objective pre-existence for its realization, at least. This is what the prefix re implies in the word re-identification. Now, perhaps the analogy suggested above becomes possible in the sense that an image, at least a conventional image, is a narrative. If we think with Aristotle again, that a minimal narrative is a reference to at least a before and an after, and carrying out our analogy a little further, we feel authorized to say that the digital object would cease to be a potent symbol in so far as its narrativity, narrativity is dissolved into the unpredictability of links that may be assessed randomly. That is, the object loses exactly the anaphoric reference to a significant pre-existence on behalf of a movement, of a succession of bits of presentness, which would eternally tend towards a nebulous future, but which the, experience, the experiencer still feels is present. Just a minute. Well, I hope I'm not boring you to death here. The paradox lies in what we'll, we will provisionally call real time. The apparent synchronicity that underlies our experience of the WWW, for example, a phenomenon that seems to destroy the very structure of that, that which purports to be a narrative. I refer here to the fragmentation and apparent loss of narrativity of news stories, for ex as an example, or rather the news clips inserted every few seconds on online news pages. Bomb exploded in Brussels. Fire squad goes to the, then that comes in different moments. That is the, it's a fragmentation of a narrative. There is, as we really nostalgically puts it in terms of the image, a superficiality that makes evident the decadence of the full, the whole, and the actual <laughs> in a world of transparency and virtuality. And to carry the argument forward myself, if I might add that the dependence on presentness turns this impotent image, which needs to seduce other eyes in order to fill itself with meaning, is there any similarity with hysterical behaviors? I, I'm talking to if there is a psychoanalyst among us, please think about this. It, well, uh, fills itself with meaning into something specular in the same sense that Umberto Eco gives to mirror images in terms of their need of the present, both temporally and spatially, to make itself known. Some people will remark that in the case of mirrors, the presentness of the image needs the presence of the object, which is at the same time its cause and its reference. Whereas in the case of technical images, the object's presentness is not necessarily constituent. Now, even bearing this objection in mind, we still have a connection in temporal terms. If the digital image is an object, as Viridio and others argue, it is a sign of itself. And therefore, 
an object of itself as a sign. But this, mind you, is a definition of a cliché. All of this is the present, or as I said before, part of a sequence of bits of presential living in that such an image is a cliché and this type of sign belongs to a, let's say, last in synchrony because it's atemporal. Hence, its perception is purely present. The impression of the present is powerful in the digital world. Uh, a preliminary cataloging that I conducted with the, with the students of mine, cataloging of verb tenses used in social media, reveals that over 90% of verbs are used in one of the present tenses, either the simple present or the continuous form. Remember Twitter? What are you doing now? This leads me to suppose that social media users have little or no use for the past or future, unless it has to do with some event that has just occurred or is about to happen. Are we in the presence of some kind of oblivion, of forgetfulness of things past, or a hey historicity that has befallen us? Some thinkers like Frederick Jameson, near neighbor of us, uh, he works at, he used to work at the Duke University right here. Um, in his essay about the ontology of the present, uh, and some thinkers like I can think that, think so, and they recognize that in the age of late capitalism, what we witness is a reduction of temporality to the present, the loss of meaning of history and continuity. Such a reduction of the past dissolves its materiality as an event. As a brute force, as a brute force that compels the present, like Peirce would have it. And this is one of the reasons why now past things become only vintage. And I have an inkling of perception that he may be right. To give you a concrete example, in the last four years in Brazil, during the far right federal administration, people feel entitled to declare that there has never been a harsh military dictatorship in the country, in spite of the historical evidence of documented atrocities and political persecution that took place in the years 1964-1985. And the present entails an immersion into feelings and sensations. Anger, hatred, elation are very vividly present in today's society and manifested every day in the media, followed by action that is very often destructive. No wonder the far right makes full and effective use of those wayward feelings in its propaganda. Well, so what? And I'm sort of coming to my uh, end here. Well, I suggest we talk about digital images so we can facilitate things. What is a digital image but a numerical interpreter designed to create future occurrences of the same image? The digital image is in its light, in this light, a convention, and it would thus constitute a prediction in as much as it is also inscribed in thirdness, just as any other technical image produced by any other media. As a matter of fact, it is, in a certain sense, much more predictable than analog images in terms of their manifestation and perhaps also in terms of their interpretation, because as we have seen, they are cliches in the very sense that symbols are habits. But images are signs of firstness, and this means that other signs are seconds and thirds. Temporally, signs and secondness, the famous trichotomy, icon, index, and symbol, are those considered in terms of their reference to an object mostly previous to them. In other words, they are signs to and of a past. As they produce interpretants, these signs change categories to become thirds, appearing as reams and disassigns and arguments. This interpretation experience throws the past towards the future in a predictive operation. Now, signs of firstness are seen merely as signs without any reference to an interpretation, and they may be, for this reason, thought of as signs of pure presentness, which we may infer do not seem to. Sorry, to exist in actuality. 
there are no pure signs, right? We have only hypo icons. In accordance with the prophets of computerized Armageddon, digital images are purely cliches and therefore a totalizing prediction of interpretation and in semiotic terms, conventional thirdness. But as they say, there are also images of the eternal present and because of that, pre-reflexive. Now, it seems we have reached an aporia here. Firstness is semiotic terms, first or third. The beginning of an answer announces itself. It would be altogether impossible to think of any sequencing in terms of pre and post without touching the now. It is necessary to remember Aristotle of the book four in physics, in the physics. What would be the difference between the Proteron or Proteron, the former, the previous, and the Hysteron or Hysteron, the latter, if, uh, if the flow is not positioned vis-a-vis -vis a now. But it's also impossible to grab this now, which is constantly dragged along by what we might call a stream of consciousness that now vanishes constantly because it's ungraspable. Firstness or thirdness, semiotically, both. But may we then discard the total presentness as a trick, an artifice of a digitality that wants more than anything to be more and more mimetic and more and more recognizable? Would we not be talking only of syntactic changes when we talk about new digital poetics on the basis of a doubtful ontology of the device? Be it as it may, much has been said by communication theorists that our age is also one of visibility. In fact, there are countless instances of this phenomenon. Suffice it to mention the proliferation of selfies counted by the millions on Instagram or Facebook and whatnot. The instantaneity of news that arrive at our devices almost at the same time that events take place plays with this visibility. We can visualize the war, the horrors of war in Ukraine as they happen, and also offers us an annulment of space together with the disappearance of the before and after. Video conference as the conferencing as the one that is taking place right now can bridge distances and time so that we can work and have fun with people thousands of miles away. So what do we have then? Pure presentness or an illusion thereof? First, thinks of reality as past. We remember our conclusion that the past is the observable, the present is the sensible. Are we facing a paradox here? Because our reality is being confused with the seen. And it's pretty clear now that the real is what is seen in contemporary terms. And this, of course, is one of the reasons why we can so easily play around with fake news. Does it make sense, therefore, to think of reality not as the observable, but as that which is felt? In our interpretation, is our interpretation of reality one in which feeling versus pre-sentiments predominate? Maybe such a confusion of perceptions caused by our digital experience can begin to explain from the point of view of semiotic why we are witnessing so much political polarization. Reality is perceived as what is given to us by television or by Facebook so that Fox News in the USA creates one reality and the BBC creates another. So one possible Answer lies in the phrase endless bits of presentness in succession towards the future interpretation, which is like the previous one. What if interpreters are controlled so that the significance is equated to the signified? If the media can control interpretation, and I believe that to some extent it can, then interpretation access falls upon the reference. And we can almost remember Roman Jacobson here, the two are collapsed into one and there is no amount of persuasion that can make me change my mind. That is already glued to one meaning. Maybe this total presentness, presentness is in fact an illusion, a very powerful illusion like virtual reality. We still have the same semiotic mechanisms at work, albeit in such a disguised fashion as to give us the impression that we have 
overcome the linearity of time? Well, I confess I do not know. And I throw the question back at you. Thank you for listening to this harangue. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Julio Pinto. It was a very insightful presentation. So now I'll do my father, Santiago. But first, let me introduce him. So Dr. Mario Santiago de Carvalho is full professor at the Faculty of Arts and Humanities of the University of Coimbra, scientific coordinator of the Research and Development Unit, the Institute for Philosophical Studies, and author of more than 200 philosophy titles among articles and monographs, published in Portuguese, English, French, Spanish, German, Italian, Romanian, and Mandarin, in the uh, description of the YouTube video, uh, there is a link there and you can access the scholarly bibliography. He has already taught at several universities around the world. And besides Portugal, he has been summoned to PhD nations in Salamanca, Paris, Paris, Louvain and Maserata. In his teachings and research activity, Mario Santiago de Carvalho privileges the history of philosophy, metaphysics, and the philosophy of music. He is the director of the international online series conimbrichances.org, as well as the coordinator of the bilingual edition of the Jesuit Coimbra course, currently being edited by the, U the Coimbra University Press. Thank you, Dr. Mario de Carvalho, for being here. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I hope you can listen to me uh, very. Are you listening? Okay, thank you. Yes, we can, we can hear you, yes. Okay, thank you, good. Okay, so let me first uh, congratulate Professor Julio Pinto for his marvelous uh, talk. Uh, as I told him earlier, before you people had come here, uh, um, I'm very good uh, in praising uh, what is being uh, done in philosophy. Uh, I don't know. I don't uh, like to criticize, and because I am not the, man, the exact man to criticize this subject, because uh, Professor Pinto's uh, talk was so rich, so vivid, um, so well informed, um, and provocative, that uh, it is behind my ambition. To, uh, to tell uh, um, or to put my finger uh, at anything at, at something that he had said and correct or criticize uh, or to say something that will be not uh, precise and not very well suitable for this kind of uh, meeting. So thank you for inviting me. I, I am not really the, the, the man for this moment but I try to do my best because um, Professor Pinto's uh, talk deserves it. So first, let me first uh, say at the outset that what I appreciated more in this talk was uh, this uh, two phases, it's two phases in the exposition. Uh, it is the method I privilege in these uh, circumstances, meaning, that when uh, we uh, address an issue so uh, uh, so present, so uh, contemporary as this one, uh, it is very good as a method to uh, envisage it from the point of view of history. And the point of view of history of the text from Plato, from Aristotle, uh, the allusions to Heidegger or Kant, um, it was a, a very uh, frame, a very good frame uh, to introduce the main topic and the main problem of this, uh, pre this present day talk. Because uh, what Professor Pinto um, present us to, presented us, us today is a very, um, not only actual, uh, not, not only contemporary, but insightful and uh, worth of being thought because it's urgent to uh, think 
about what is happening or what the the the, the very the, the major uh, <laughs> of virtual reality, digital ham images, um, and all the new world that is coming to us, and uh, uh, it perhaps philosophers and mostly those kind of philosophers just like me who prefer to deal with these objects uh, from the point of view of the history of philosophy are too slow to uh, give a correct answer or even to understand what is really happening because what is really happening belongs mostly to uh, matters to fields uh, related to um, engineering uh, with um, realities and computers uh, the hard work we as philosophers do not really understand but if we do not really understand how these things work it is imperative to uh, become aware of the things as, as, as soon as possible in the way we can do it and to frame it correctly because um, it is, as Professor Pintus, uh, in the background of Professor Spring Pintus, I, I, I thought, I thought to, re I, I think I recognize um, a preoccupation uh, because uh, the, a matter of concern because he addresses uh, the, 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 the digital world and the digital image uh, in a, with this kind of last and final question uh that is uh, the, the, the question we must deal with and we must answer uh it is that it is what we are dealing with is visibility an illusion or what but uh, before we uh, i come to this last point uh i would like also to emphasize the the first part of the of his presentation what he called the bird's eye view on the sensible of course, uh, the, the, to, to, to put together time and sensible uh, is a courageous effort. Uh, time is, uh, well, is one of the key words of the history of philosophy. Um, mm -hmm. We could address it from several perspectives. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not clear what is uh, the real perspective of Professor Pintus, but he surely gives us an int when he quotes uh, the, the fourth book of uh, the, the physics of Aristotle, uh, which is uh, the, sale, the, the re renowned phrase that says that uh, the present or the time is the measure of uh, what the, of the past and of the future but puts the stress on the capacity, on the ability of to measure. It means that the soul must measure something. And this is the perspective of time, which is, content, which is a, a, an ordinary one, if we if, allow me to say it's, uh, this, this, in this, with this manner, very vulgar, uh, because this is the usual time, the, 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 the time of today, the time of uh, usual life, the common life. Um, but um, what is what was very interesting for me in this bird's eye uh, uh, about the uh, in his relation to time and uh, um, uh, the sensible uh, was the capacity or uh, the experience or the way he opened us. To, uh, uh, to put together um, the sensible and the time and measure both subjects uh, uh, in uh, the perspective of the of Western point of view, but, in the but confronting it with the most impressive and most urgent problem of today, which is to answer or to give a key to understand what is happening uh, or what is the, the, the frame of the present of time uh, and of time uh, after this kind of uh, um, situation we are experiencing now uh, in the wake of uh, the virtual reality. 
uh, I was particular uh, struck also by the, the his um, reading of what an object is and the sub uh, he, he, he did not uh, name the subject but of course the object is the opposite of subject so what he called the objectum in, in greek the antikamenon and the subject the eupokamenon and this notion of eupokamenon that dr julio pinto did not address is of course the other part of the objectum the antikamenon uh, that he uh, that he inter was interested most for. Um, anyway, uh, this um, pers this perspective, philosoph this perspective, um, this voyage through the history of philosophy from Plato uh, to uh, contemporary philosophers, um, it was also very interesting because he. Uh, it put us together, uh, to, it put us in front of a problem we are really experiencing in everyday life, but uh, that we not, do not uh, take particular uh, recognition of, which is the fragility of language. Uh, I was uh, very well interested in the, what is, he told us about the Haimaras, uh, the, the grammar, of those uh, southern uh, persons, uh, but uh, the, the, the problem with the grammar uh, is that what we what he said about the Aymaras can also be said about other kinds of grammars. Remember, for instance, mm -hmm. the situation of the Hebrew language, or, or or even the situation of the Arabic, where the verbs of the future and of the verbs of the past. Are, uh, have have not the dimension uh, we uh, uh, convey to them uh, when we speak from our point of view of Indo-European languages. So uh, this is a perspective of a Western philosopher, of course. So in, from this point of view, a perspective of a Western philosopher is only a perspective. Uh, this is pro probably uh, La Palis, uh, La Palis, uh, true of La Palis, of course, but um, we should uh, be aware of the fact that philosophy is, of course, uh, a key to understand those, these realities, but it's only one key, one possible key. Um, the present, uh, from this point of view, of course, uh, and if we are if we regarding temporality or time, uh, it is natural that the present becomes powerful um, and his power in the digital world is still more powerful. Uh, and this issue was addressed by Professor Julio Pinto with clarity. And I can only but follow his uh, words and his perspective. Of course, uh, the, the, the second part of this of his uh, talk, um, which addressed mostly with the digital image, uh, and this, uh, in, and as a kind of deconstruction, the situation, uh, a negative de deconstruction, because uh, in in the end. He told us that digital images may be an illusion. Um, of course, this, this is a reading that uh, we must pay attention to if we are uh, true philosophers that are uh, attentive to what is happening, what the, the, the dangers of what is happening from the point of view of this um, present so powerful and the absence of space and the absence of time mostly of past time and even of future uh, i won't i do not know what professor julio pinto uh, could say about the future the the meaning and its force or absence in this kind of reality but uh, i would like also to put uh, to dr julio pinto one simple question and it is this uh, if it, yes, I agree with you that uh, the digital uh, image in the hand 
is an illusion, but maybe an illusion, but and it's terrible to acknowledge it. And it is also uh, very important to pick up this idea and to get and to stick with it and to, uh, to in order to recognize the, the problems uh, connected mm -hmm. with this uh, reality, with this uh, situation. But can we not uh, address the digital world, the digital images, this uh, uh, huge presence of the present uh, in, a, in, a, in a positive way too? I mean, uh, usually philosophers have the tendency to, uh, uh, and, and it is understandable, read all these problems, all these uh, changes, all this future ahead of us in a, with a negative side. So uh, my question would also, would also be, is there any possible, possible is, there, is it possible to see in all these kind of chances, even re in relation with time, mostly in the presence of the presence, the power of the presence, mm -hmm. uh, any positivity here? Um, but mm. this is a question. But nevertheless, and I, I now, I'll, uh, I'm, well, I have to finish. But nevertheless, I would say that uh, I do enjoy uh, hearing, uh, uh, take, being present here, uh, learning from you. I sympathize with you, with your perspective. And I even would say that uh, if, in fact, uh, ahead of us, we are uh, acknowledging that digital Im a digital image is an illusion. So perhaps as philosophers, how uh, uh, policy, our attitude could be one attitude just like the, the 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 just like the the one Plato suggested in the Republic, meaning a kind of allegory of the cave, uh, mm. and uh, to put to 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 get out from this obscurity, which is the the uh, the huge presence of light that can, that mm. enables us to see. And uh, I uh, personally uh, would like to put your uh, your research because you have said that uh, in the first in the beginning of your talk that these belong to your latest research. So I would like to mm -hmm. put this research of you in into this uh, this historical uh, perspective of the late Plato and the political need of philosophers to bring light into the light, because this light is um, enable us to see, enabling us to see. Thank you again, and uh, um, I wish you all the best. Thank you. Can I? Uh, Hello? Doctor, yes. Yes, please. You can. Okay. You can. Yeah. Okay. I, I'd like to, uh, first of all, thank you so much for your uh, very generous uh, appreciation of my uh, work. And, uh, and I must say right at the outset that I do uh, think of the digital not totally in this uh, negative way. I was uh, actually in this paper, I wanted to point out some of the frailties or the fragilities of uh, what's happening uh, right now. That is the way I see them, of course. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> there are a few things that I'd like to, to say. Uh, well, first of all, I think that part of our job as I would not call myself a philosopher. I would probably call myself as a semiotician, but we are close cousins, right? First cousins, maybe. Uh, our job, I think, would be exactly to shed light 
into those things if if people will listen to us. Uh, and uh, I think, and I'm all for, you know, technological progress. I'm not against it. On the contrary, you know, I think that we're in for wonderful stuff that is coming out of uh, research in uh, those areas, such as robotics in, uh, and artificial intelligence and uh, things of the sort. Um, as long as we can think of uh, maybe computers going out of the one zero binary logic and uh, maybe throwing us into something that would be a little more symbiotic for lack of a better word of it. But anyways, the, uh, the myth of the cave uh, in Plato is of course uh, something that refers to this light from outside the cave, that is to, to make people understand things. Uh, it could be some external force and maybe we could be this external force, but we have to have enough critical mass in order to know it. Otherwise we would be isolated uh, voices here and there and uh, treated as weirdos or as, you know, uh, those crazy people who keep saying those things, but anyway, of course, I'm approaching time uh, from the point of view of Western, uh, the Western experience of time, mostly linear time. Uh, and there are, as you mentioned, you know, there are some other languages or many other languages that would treat, uh, you know, structure and grammar, uh, structure, the structure of language or morphosyntax in a different way. Uh, I, I'm a, I was thinking here, as you mentioned Hebrew, I was thinking here of the Algonquian, Algonquian languages, the languages, for indigenous languages here in the United States that do not have the same type of uh, treatment of time or tense, that is verb tense. In their language, they, they don't use tense at all, they use aspects. Therefore, their conception of time is entirely different than ours. And, and here is another problem that is that it goes back to the Worf, uh, Worf, uh, the Worfian uh, hypothesis that is, do languages shape our views, our worldview? Which is another thing we have to, to, to worry about. And actually, I do believe that this is partly contained in what I have just said, that is, language does sort of shape the way we view the world. But anyways, uh, of course, it would be great to treat time in terms of uh, the physics of it, quantum quantum mechanics of it. Uh, but I, well, first of all, I'm not that well equipped uh, in order to talk about that. But anyway, we can, just to answer you uh, briefly, we can actually address the digital in a positive way. There are some things that are lost, but of course, there is always this uh, counting of, of things that are lost as other things are gained. Uh, you know, like in translation, for example, right? Uh, every, there are some there's some gains in translation, but also there's some losses in translation. Um, and so, uh, for example. I like music and you are a, a professor of music philosophy. And there's one thing about uh, digital recordings that really uh, kills me. I'd rather listen to uh, Billie Holiday singing in the original recordings with all the noise, because that gives me the actual sense of when that thing was recorded then to read, to, to listen to a digitalization or digitization of uh, an older recording that eliminates all the background noise and saying that this is the pure music. I don't think so. I think the pure music is the impure music that, that Billie Holiday recorded. See what I mean? But anyways, uh, so thank you so much uh, for your very generous uh, uh, talk and your very generous perception of my work. Uh, and just one more thing that I'd like to say. It is quite fashionable nowadays in our, and we know in our academic world, to pick up a certain, cert, cert, to pick up certain um, 
gurus uh, and uh, place them on a pedestal and start praising them as the new voice that will, of course, overshadow any other voices in the past. Uh, and this is pretty dangerous. So I always refer to this accumulation of knowledge, and I always like to bring, you know, the substantial thinkers of the past into our discussions of the present, because I do believe that the past compels the present in many different ways. So uh, I, I don't really like this election of, uh, you know, certain gurus because they, and sometimes they're mistaken people. They they are not at. They're just saying that they are. You know, it's like uh, one time uh, John Searle gave a lecture in the United States, and uh, uh, that's a long time ago. And uh, Wolfgang Isa was a part of the audience there, and I was sitting there in the back, you know, very timidly. But anyways, and he said, John Searle said, well something like everything that has been said about this you know, can be forgotten because now i come up with the truth and of course everybody was deeply irritated with that but of course there will be a number of followers on john searle saying that this guy is really you know the thing that will change the world i don't believe that i think that we uh or we just lay little bricks you know on the wall that is that should be constructed but anyways Thank you so much uh, for for this, and uh, I I believe that now uh, we open for questions from the audience. But may, but may, may I put you another questions yet? Oh sure, go, go right ahead. Oh so, sorry, thank you. Uh, I, I have a, a, a particular question that I would like to hear. What do you think about it? Uh, because uh, it seems that uh, the way you cope with present uh, and your mm -hmm. very interesting note on the past is observable and the present is sensible. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, is, it is very, very interesting. But is, it, is, is this not uh, the, um, a kind of uh, nostalgia regarding uh, a pure presentification or pure present that is impossible. Well, in, in other words, and to be more mm -hmm. straightforward, mm -hmm. what would you answer right. to the Augustinian riddle mm -hmm. regarding that uh, there is no past, there is no future, there is only the present mm -hmm. of the past, mm -hmm. the present of yeah. the future, and the present of the present. Mm -hmm. But saying this, yeah. we mm -hmm. must conclude that there is no presence at all. What is mm -hmm. real the present? What is your present when we address it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, when I think about the, the present is, I think that, uh, you know, whenever I'm uh, I, I'm asleep and then I woke, I open my eyes and I am immediately immersed into something to which I give the name of present uh, because it's, I feel that I'm within it, even though I cannot pinpoint exactly uh, when this thing began and when it ended, or if it will end. Uh, that is, I move through several reference points. And uh, if I move through several reference points, uh, beginning with whenever, uh, I always feel that I am in something that I call the present. And, uh, and memory, and memory is probably what is the, you know, something that will bring me to the present, will bring, will bring something that happened before to me now. Although, uh, whenever I think of what happened to me before, I will always think of it in terms of what I'm feeling now. So I think that, uh, well, I'm probably indebted to uh, people at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, uh, and I'm thinking of people who uh, were at the same time thinking of the same things. I'm talking about Sigmund Freud, I'm talking about Charles Peirce, I'm talking about Albert Einstein, and I'm, I'm you know, I'm talking about Ferdinand Saussure uh, and uh, 
and lots of literary people, uh, that everybody was saying that there is no such thing as any certainty. And I'm not certain, uh, and I believe that, I'm not certain exactly what the past is. I only, I only know that what is written, that is what's observable, what is thought in terms of pragmatism. I think of myself as a pragmatic person, uh, that is, or as a pragmatist. Uh, and I think of the present as something that occupies our senses. And I'm, I'm a, a believer in the senses. Something uh, not Lockean, of course, uh, not that simple, but uh, something that occupies our senses and something that in a way uh, directs our perceptions and even our reasoning. Uh, I don't know if I made myself clear, uh, Professor, but I don't even know if I answered your question. I just uh, started rambling on here. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, we, will, we will close the broadcast on YouTube, but we will open the floor to the audience present here. But okay. let me thank you. Dr. Julio Pinto and Dr. Mario de Carvalho, it was a brilliant presentation and a brilliant discussion. But so now welcome. the floor is open to the audience.